This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like, you know to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome to the Chalkboard, my fellow football nerds, for episode number 171 of Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Shane Half, and you can follow me on Twitter and YouTube at ShaneHalfNFL. I'm joined today by the best co-host in the game. You've heard him on the Tough Cover Radio Show. It is Mark Henry Jr. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Henry Jr. underscore Mark. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Uh, for our video listeners, I'm about to hold up our our new third guest here, uh, my my new pup Becky, uh, who runs who now runs our apartment. Uh, but my wife's not home, and she's still a lap dog. So we are gonna keep her on my lap here, so she doesn't make any noise for the audio listeners. Uh, but that's a little tease for the audio listeners to come check out the video on YouTube if you're a pup person and want to want to see a cute pup there that I that I flashed at the beginning of the pod. There you go. We need to, we got to rebrand the podcast now. We've got, you know, you've got like the Mina Kime show featuring Lenny. We've got Chalk Talk featuring Becky. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Becky, we need to figure out what, what type of uh, Becky's. We'll see if Becky has some takes throughout the show. I'm sure she likes who, who are the dog teams. I guess the Browns are kind of like a dog team. Is there any other like dog based mascot in the NFL? There's a ton in college, obviously. But- yeah. I don't think so. Maybe she just likes the underdogs. Maybe she picks, she, she, she bets the underdogs. Maybe so. Maybe we should just say up front, if Becky barks during the show, whatever team we're talking about when uh-huh. it happens, Becky's making a Super Bowl prediction. So exactly. Uh uh-uh. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so no pressure, but all right, well, let's dive into it. Uh, recording a little later today. I had a doctor's appointment this morning. So this show will not hit your guys's feed as early as we normally like to get it out on Monday, but that's okay. It'll be there hopefully for your drive home uh, from work. We're going to go through all of the Sunday action uh, with a special focus on the other NFC East teams. And obviously one of the NFC East teams plays tonight. Uh, Washington is like a seven and a half point underdog at Cincinnati. So you can tune into that game. Uh, But I know a lot gets lost in the shuffle on a typical Sunday. So let's dive in. Let's talk about the New York Giants at the Cleveland Browns. The Giants win this game 21 to 15. Um, the first part of the title of this episode is Malik Neighbors May Save Daniel Jones. Um, and we're going to get to that. But this game started as a disaster for the Giants. They fumble the opening kickoff. The Browns score a play later. Uh, then they go three and out. But on the next drive, Daniel, or excuse me, on the next drive, Daniel Jones is intercepted on the first play but it was wiped out by roughing the passer penalty. So after that, he leads a 13 play 81 yard touchdown drive. 
three and out the next possession, but then two more touchdown drives to end the half. Uh, Daniel Jones ended the day 24 of 34 for 236 yards, two touchdowns and zero interceptions. But I mean, the big takeaway from this game, Mark, is Malik Neighbors is a is a star, right? I mean, he ends with eight catches, 78 yards and two touchdowns, which if you remove to those two touchdowns, eight catches, 78 yards, isn't like a banner day, but some of those catches were just incredible. And he became the first player in NFL history with 20 or more receptions, 250 more yards, and three or more touchdowns in his first three games. So on the Giants side, Malik Neighbors looks really good. On the Brown side, it's just bad, man. The offense showed signs of life in week two. They only put up 15 points in week three against a not very good Giants defense. Deshaun Watson took eight sacks in this game. Uh, Mark, where do you go on this one? I, it depends if you're going glass half full or glass half empty. I guess when you lo- when you watch this game, I we were, I watched these games with a couple buddies at the park sportsbooks. So we had every game going, uh, which is a fun way to watch the one o'clock Eagles games and keep track of everything else. And, and the first thing that happened on NFL Sunday was the Cleveland Browns returning a kickoff, and it felt like oh my god, or, or I should say the Giants fumbling a kickoff, the Browns recovering and then scoring a touchdown right away. And it felt like the Browns are up seven, nothing. They're getting the ball after halftime. How is this going to work out for the giants? And that should show just how incompetent I think. And maybe this is me looking glass half empty at this game. Cause I don't think either of these teams are any good. Uh, I guess if you wanted to go glass half full, you could say the giants beat them 21 to eight for the rest of the game. If you take out that unlucky kind of break to start the game, I would look at it as the Browns lost that game 21 to eight. Uh, for for the rest of the game there. So uh, it, it's, I, I just, I, I can't emphasize how incompetent Deshaun Watson is. And this was actually probably one of his better games um, in terms of he had 196 yards. He didn't turn the ball over. At least he threw for two touchdowns. And he still had like a 27.3 QPR. He had 16 in completions, pretty inaccurate. Like, and this is the best you're going to get, I think. And it's not great. So I I, I think it's more... I'm taking away from this game that the Browns are a disaster and are going to win six or less games than that the Giants are some good team. And maybe it just shows that maybe the Giants aren't going to be fighting for the number one pick like I thought they were in the preseason or after the first two weeks. Maybe Dable has it going a little bit too much for that to happen. Uh, But, yeah, I'm not coming away from this game too impressed with the Giants. And here's what I say. We might have an NFL game of the year when it comes from a gambling standpoint for me coming up on Thursday, because I think the Dallas Cowboys being only minus four and a half against the New York giants in New York on Thursday night football is stealing money. That is an absolute Cowboys beat down spot. Dak has owned the giants. I don't think the Cowboys are all that good, but I still think they're a good bit better than the giants. And I think we're going to see them come out and, you know, even if the Cowboys do have problems for long-term, I think this is kind of their get back spot against a bad team where we take away too much of it because the giants it's just in the Sunday morning, that spread was seven and a half Cowboys minus seven and a half at New York on Thursday. We're saying a three point loss from the Ravens and a six point win over to Sean Watson means that line should move three points not to give away too much from the next game. But uh, I, I just think that the Giants overreaction is even the neighbors overreaction. People are saying he's got offensive rookie of the year kind of sewed up. I've seen some tweets like that and I understand the quarterbacks haven't looked good. I would say it's early and, and one of those guys could definitely still get back in the conversation. And I'd also say if you, you know, you look at Marvin Harrison jr. The last two weeks, he's been just as good as neighbors. Obviously he had the weird week one, then he had four catches, 130 yards, two touchdowns, five catches, 64 yards, and a touchdown. And then kind of the controversial <clears throat> take that me and Shane both had, we both liked Odunze more than Neighbors. And Odunze finally kind of stepped up, six catches, 112 yards, and a touchdown. That rookie receiver class, I think we were right to say that it was just a special, special receiver class no matter how you had it ranked out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We'll go to a couple comments here. Anthony chiming in on Twitter uh, says, hope you guys are doing well. Thanks for joining the show, Anthony. uh, Daniel chiming in on YouTube says, not going to lie, the Browns defense is not as elite as I thought it was. And that's one of the things we've talked about, though. 
defensive performance just isn't typically sticky year over year. Like they were an elite defense last year. I think they're probably still going to be a good defense this year, but there also just comes a breaking point when your offense looks inept. And he says Stefanski yep. might just be garbage. That's certainly possible. Um, it's all, it's also like an established fact that Deshaun Watson is. So it's a tough situation there in Cleveland for sure. But let's move on to Dallas, who is also in a tough situation uh, at one and two. And Mark, you and I both predicted that we thought one of the Cowboys or the 49ers could have a disaster season incoming, and they both sit at one and two after two weeks. But Dallas loses this game 28 to 25. And Mark, there's going to be scientific studies conducted about the Ravens in the fourth quarter. I mean, with under 11 minutes left to play, they had the ball inside the Dallas 30, leading 28 to six. Justin Tucker misses a 46 yard field goal. The Cowboys score a touchdown, recover an onside kick. When's the last time you saw somebody recover an onside kick? They score another touchdown, attempt another onside kick. This time's the Ravens recover it, but they went three and out, by the way, choosing to punt on fourth and three from the Dallas 40. Gave up another touchdown, and then mercifully they managed to pick up a couple of first downs and run the final three minutes off the clock. But the Ravens about blew yet another fourth quarter lead in this one and i don't know what the deal is with them but this seems like a weekly thing almost um the cowboys run defense remains a major problem they allowed 274 rushing yards on 45 attempts that's 6.1 yards per carry three touchdowns and it's not just lamar like scrambling and padding the stats if you remove his rushing they still rush for 187 yards and six yards per attempt and so the Cowboys' rush defense is really bad. Their rushing attack is equally bad. They rush 16 times for 51 yards. Uh, wide receivers are not open for Dak often. He threw into a tight window on 35% of his pass attempts, which is the highest rate of any game in the NFL over the last six seasons. And so uh, there's a lot of trouble in Dallas, and – they're going to have to figure something out. And I mean, they start to click a little bit in the fourth quarter, but at this point you almost coming back against the Ravens in the fourth quarter. I don't even know if that counts as an accomplishment. I walked away pretty impressed with the Cowboys after the comeback. I'll say that. I think it would have been pretty easy for them to pack it in. And I know that we're, we're saying the Raiders do the Ravens do this every week, but I, I do think it was, it would have been pretty easy to pack it in. The onside kick was pretty creative and kind of surprising to come up with one. Um, and for them to give up 274 yards on the ground and be as bad as they were defensively, it, it is impressive that the offense was able to kind of mount a little bit of a comeback at the end of the game. And I, I think, you know, it's funny for this, it's funny to say, you know, Lamar only passed the ball 15 times in this game he was so good 182 yards passing over 12 yards per attempt um and obviously 87 yards running and a touchdown on the ground and it seemed like they were almost like it's oh and two let's break glass in case of emergency and use derrick henry 25 times i don't know if maybe <laughs> they were trying to conserve him a little bit maybe keep him fresh and only give him 10 to 15 carries a game but it seemed like they were like, you know what, we're, we're going to give him the full compliment here uh, against the against the Cowboys. And obviously it was a good matchup for that, for sure. Uh, it's it, The Ravens, I, I think, are going to be right back in this thing. I, I know that they have a brutal kind of – I mean, this start to the season that they gave the Ravens is brutal. And that's why it was so tough to lose that Raiders game. You, you probably really wanted to get that one because you just look at what's upcoming here – and you've got Buffalo coming to Baltimore next week. You're going to Cincinnati after that. Now, we can talk about what Cincinnati is after tonight uh, again, on Monday Night Football, and we'll find out more about them. But I, it's not – I don't think going to Cincinnati is any easy feat. You've got the Commanders coming. That's not, that's not supposed to be a tough matchup. Then you go to Tampa, to Cleveland, uh, to Denver. You get Cincy again. You go to Pittsburgh, the Chargers, the Eagles, like – there's a lot of good teams in there coming up here for the Ravens. I think they're good enough to withstand it, and I think they're good enough to win their fair share of those games. Uh, but, man, the schedule makers did the Ravens no favors this season. Yeah. Uh, one final note from this game is that 
Uh, I had to save this for the end. So Mark was done with his spiel and it didn't throw him off his game as he rolled his eyes, but the kicking crown has been passed. Oh, officially. This is, no, I, you have, uh, to, yeah. Brandon Aubrey hits a 51 yarder and a 65 yarder in this game. He converts the onside kick. Meanwhile, Justin Tucker misses his third field goal of the year. Uh, man, Justin Tucker looking really bad for years. He was so automatic. So Brandon Aubrey, Congratulations, you're the new best kicker in the NFL. Yeah, on Heed the Call, my guy Dan Hansis, who uh, actually he gave me a shout out last week on their pod um, because he's he really hates Syria. This is a, a side track here, but he okay, real first, I'll give the real point. They do a thing on that show called the Kicker Club that they do for a year. They play this EDM music and they update you on whoever the best kickers are and who's allowed in the club, who's kicked out of the club. And they had to unfortunately remove Justin Tucker as the head of the Kickers Club and appoint Brandon Aubrey. So it's it's something we had to mention. It's very clear Tucker's lost it. And, and did you see at the end of the game him and Harbaugh were arguing? I did not, no. Be- because Harbaugh punted from the 40, I guess, and Tucker probably wanted to kick. And it looks like Harbaugh is saying, look, just be happy we won the game. Just be happy we won the game. And and they're like yelling at each other. So we might get a rough Justin Tucker year. That might be what unfurls the 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 uh, Ravens season here a a little bit. But yeah, but the funny I the Dan Hans a shout out. He gave me a shout out from Twitter because he hates Sirianni and he thinks Howie gets a little bit too much credit. So, but he really was tweeting up a storm on Monday Night Football when Jason Kelsey and those guys were taking over the broadcast and he was not happy about it. And he used to love the Eagles when they were beating the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So I tweeted at him, you know, this bit, uh, you, you made this bit a real, a real hatred now. Uh, it, you know, you've worked yourself into a shoot for wrestling terms. So he gave me a shout out and, and a brief shout out from for Twitter on the pod. Uh, so he, he said he'll stop. So for the Heed the Call listeners who also listen to this show, hopefully I helped the Dan Hans' Eagles hate. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the Thursday night football game briefly. Uh, the New England Patriots at the New York Jets. This was not a very exciting game. The Jets win 24-3. to um, The Jets offense punted on their opening drive and then scored a touchdown on three of their next four drives uh, with a missed field goal from the 27-yard line being the other one. So, Aaron Rodgers looked to be firing on all cylinders. The Jets have other guys stepping up. Braylon Allen topped Brees Hall uh, with 55 rushing yards on 11 carries. Um, He had one more yard on five less carries. Uh, However, Hall did have the touchdown. Uh, Olu Fashanu had to step in for Morgan Moses, and he didn't allow a pressure on six pass blocking snaps. He played 14 total snaps. I would say... The Jets do have seven penalties in each of the last two games. That's something that they need to clean up, but they're operating really well. Um, On the Patriots side of the ball, it was kind of a disaster. They started Caden Wallace at left tackle, a place he never played in college. And the Patriots took seven sacks against the Jets, who were playing without Jermaine Johnson and still without Hassan Reddick. Uh, Jacoby Brissett was pressured on 56.5% of his dropbacks. They put Drake May in late in the game, and he didn't fare much better. He went four of eight for 22 yards with two sacks. So that offensive line in New England is kind of an abomination, especially with all the injuries they have. And especially against the Jets' D-line that had really struggled in the first two weeks, especially in week one um, in terms of the pass rush and without Jermaine Johnson and Hassan Reddick. So I, I to me – I'm not going to take away too much from this game other than Aaron Rodgers looking like Aaron Rodgers. Um, I think that's the only takeaway you can have. I think the Patriots are just really bad. And I think the first two weeks were a bit of a mirage that they Mm -hmm. played way above their heads. Um, So I I just, I hesitate as someone who was high on the jets and picked the jets to win the division. I feel like people are getting a little carried away with, with the jets after this big win. So we'll see if they kind of handle business here. They, they have, uh, the Broncos coming up next week, and then they play the Vikings in London. Uh, I'm really curious to see these next couple games for the Jets because Rodgers looking like Rodgers now is a big development, but I don't I don't know if that means that the defensive line is fixed because they beat up on the Patriots. I know it looked really good in this game, but no Hassan Reddick, no Jermaine Johnson, and they were struggling with Johnson in there, obviously without Reddick earlier in the year. I just think when it comes to these better teams or, or better running teams especially – uh, it's going to be a problem for that defense, but maybe the offense will be able to score more. 
Uh, something very notable happened in this game, by the way. I've got to mention with uh, first drive of the second half for the Jets, Aaron Rodgers threw the 480th touchdown pass of his career. It was caught by Garrett Wilson. Uh, the reason that is notable is that it was his 480th career touchdown pass. As I said, it's the first one that was ever caught by a wide receiver drafted in the first round. So it's a <laughs> First first round receiver touchdown of Aaron Rodgers' career on TD pass number four eighty. That's that's incredible. I will say, Garrett Wilson a little bit of a disappointing start to the year. I said if Garrett Wilson was the top five ish guy, who everybody told me he was, especially from a fantasy standpoint, then I thought the Jets would be a, a Super Bowl contender. He hasn't been bad the first week. Six catches, sixty yards. Four catches, 57 yards this week. Only five catches for 33, but he got the touchdown. Uh, let's let's see a little more from Garrett. Alan, Alan Lazard is a touchdown vulture. Yeah, but even like five catches for 33 yards. Let's let's get Garrett Wilson a little bit more involved. And I know Rodgers had a good game here, but a little bit yeah. too much Lazard, Mike Williams, Braylon Allen. Let's, let's see what we can do with Wilson. Yeah. Okay, let's get into the Sunday slate. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts at the Chicago Bears. The Colts win 21-16. to 16. Uh, It was the Colts' defense that led the way for this win, which is kind of stunning when you consider how their defense has looked through the first two weeks. They held the Bears to 63 rushing yards on 28 attempts. They had previously allowed almost 500 rushing yards in the first two weeks combined. Uh, they intercepted Caleb Williams twice. They strip-sacked him once. They sacked him three other times. Uh, Jalen Jones recorded both interceptions. Leatu Latu had the strip sack, um, which is good because Anthony Richardson looks far more bad than good so far. He was 10 of 20 with two interceptions in this game. Uh, to give you an idea where that trust meter is at, Shane Steichen called a handoff to Jonathan Taylor on fourth and three later in the game, taking the ball out of Richardson's hands. Um, and Caleb Williams, he, he flashed. You know, in a few instances, he threw for 363 yards, but he also threw two picks. Uh, he get, had the strip sack. The offense still just doesn't look right. Um, Leatu Latu, however, looks very right. Generated seven pressures. He has the strip sack on 28 pass rush attempts. That's the most pressures generated by a rookie in a game this season. So Leatu Latu stock up. Yeah, Anthony Richardson is something... Uh, you know, it, it's hard to even evaluate. They, they, uh, there was a tweet that was going viral about two plays that happened back to back with like a 60 yard bomb. And then one of the worst interceptions you've ever seen. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy. I don't, I don't know how this is possible. And maybe this is like an indictment on passer rating. There was a tweet going around. I don't know if this is true. It had a ton of people talking about it. it said if Anthony Richardson, Anthony Richardson could have went over 20, with two interceptions and had a better passer rating than he had yesterday. I don't know why, how that would be the case if he went 10 for 20 with two interceptions, but someone tweeted that about how bad his passer rating is. I think they said it was the worst passer rating by a Colts quarterback in a win since 1979. Um, this was truly one of the weird Eagles saints for uh, obviously everyone. A lot of people listening are big Eagles fans. That was the weirdest game I've ever seen potentially. I put Bears Colts right there with it. it. It was up there amongst the weirdest games you'll see in the modern day NFL. And Caleb, for all the mistakes that he did make, it's hard not to pin a lot of them on the offensive line when you watch it. That O line is just so bad. It is absolutely brutal. These Darnell Wright and Tevin Jenkins have both been disastrous to start this year, two pretty high picks over the last couple of years. Um, Caleb Williams did throw for 363 yards in this game and there was a lot of throws that you could point to and be like there it is there's the Caleb Williams that we all know is in there but it just feels like the O-line's not going to give him a chance to to prove that and you know that's that's bared out by how bad they are from a run blocking perspective 2.3 yards per carry swift three years 24 million dollars he's rushing for one and a half yards per carry so far this year it's that's a pretty bleak contract they gave out there yeah it's it's hard and they Caleb. did it the year after the Panthers did the same thing with Miles Sanders, who also doesn't play and do anything. And Sanders was at least better than Swift was for the Eagles, yeah. or at least more consistent over a couple of years. So, yeah, they, they were both crazy contracts to give out. And it's 
uh, we said this, I think when the Saquon and Henry contracts were given out, and I think we were kind of proven right to like those contracts. Uh, those are the, I'm willing to pay a little bit, maybe a million or two extra from the, the average Tony Pollard, DeAndre Swift tier of running backs to get to Saquon and Derrick Henry. And I'm very glad we did that instead of trying to do the half measure and not go 12 million per year for a running back and go 8 million per year. Like, yeah, I'll take that difference for $4 million. That was my biggest take of the all season about our running back position for the Eagles. And it's bearing out with Swift looking absolutely cooked there in Chicago. But I think if Caleb had a running game, if Caleb had, a, had any sort of O line, um, it, it would be, it, it would look a lot different. There was enough in this game for me to keep believing in Caleb. Yeah. Uh, the passer rating thing, if he was O of 20 with no interceptions, he would have had a pat higher passer rating by like a half a point. Maybe that's, but what they were, yeah, I, I yeah. Know. Cause it, it factors in heavily touchdowns and touchdowns per that attempt and that interceptions yeah. per attempt. And since he had no touchdowns anyways, that uh, makes sense. yeah. Okay. Let's roll on to Houston where Minnesota beats the Texans 34 to seven and Mark I don't know as crazy as it is it could be time to talk about the Vikings as contenders in the NFC uh they sit three and oh they have victories over the 49ers and the Texans Brian Flores appears to have evolved into his final form uh before a garbage time a final drive the Vikings allowed only 224 yards they had two interceptions five sacks they shut down the run game uh was this the Jonathan Grenard revenge game? I don't know if I don't know if like he feels like he should get revenge on the Texans. Maybe not, but uh, he had three sacks and six pressures in this game. And then on top of that, Sam Darnold is playing well. He was seventeen to twenty-eight, one hundred eighty-one yards and four touchdowns. Minnesota was four or five in the red zone. Uh, this is the first time in Darnold's career that he's thrown multiple touchdowns in three straight games, which is wild for a first-round pick. Um, and, you know, on Houston's side, it's just a bad day. Bad day in the office. Tip, pass, interception on the first play. You miss a field goal on the second drive. At one point, they had four consecutive pre-snap penalties. Um, they had a they strip sack Sam Darnold at one point. It was picked up by a wide receiver and turned into a seven-yard game. Like, if you're Houston, I think the, the takeaway is just burn the tape and go in next week. But if you're Minnesota – it's got to be feeling pretty good to sit on top of that division right now. Yeah. Cam Akers, by the way, should never be on an NFL team again. I, I don't understand why people keep giving Cam Akers a chance. Um, he was terrible in this game, and I don't know why he was Houston's primary backup to Joe Mixon. That's a terrible that's a terrible plan coming to come into the season with because he's bad at football. And nine carries, 21 yards, proves that out. They couldn't run the ball at all. And this, I know that there's a lot of attention being paid to Brian Flores and, and, uh, and everyone's talking about how good of a job he's doing. Somehow I don't think it's enough attention being paid to how insane this is what he's doing. He is, th this defense is not that talented. They, mm -hmm. they really are not. You, I mean, we came into the year talking about this team could be one of the worst secondaries in football. And, and we talked about some of the other teams that were in that running. Those have bared out the commanders, that bared out the uh, the, the uh, um, it's blank. The Colts secondary has not been very good. We've seen a, a lot of these teams that we pegged as having terrible secondaries come out and prove us right. The Vikings come out. They look like one of the best defenses in football, maybe the best defense in football to start this year. Something tells me that obviously defense has kind of been ruling the roost here to start the year across the NFL, but especially with Minnesota with Brian Flores. Something tells me the offensive geniuses will have kind of a counter for whatever's going on with two high safety, especially being used more and everything that's kind of preventing scoring. And something tells me that people will eventually be able to exploit the obvious talent deficiencies that I think still do exist on that defense. Once they figure out what Flores is doing, you saw Purdy go up to guys in the Vikings defense and say like, I didn't know what I was looking at. Like I, I was, totally confused i've never had anything like that like flores totally messes me up and he had the same game against them last year um but we did see last year he did a great job early in the season there did hit a point in the middle of the year where it seems like either injuries caught up to them or people 
had figured out a little bit of what Flores was doing in terms of his masking blitzes and dropping back in coverage, which is the main thing he does is he acts like he's going to blitz. He brings it all in the box. He, per- he dares you to run. But then once you hike it and don't run, he drops back a lot of guys kind of that's uh, that's kind of a trademark of a Flores defense. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how people adjust to it, uh, but it's, it's tough to not – it's tough to take away too much from it because it happened against San Fran and then it happened against C.J. Stroud now. Uh, but I, something tells me they'll figure it out. I think the Sam Darnold stuff's going way too far. I think Justin Jefferson is really good. I think they have a good O-line. I think Kevin O'Connell's a really good coach. He wasn't that good in this game. He had 180 yards. He just threw for four touchdowns. And I know just threw for four touchdowns <laughs> might sound stupid to some people. I, 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 there's a lot of me that's starting to think like – Touchdown variance is a lot of luck with like, uh, you know, game to game with these players. And maybe that's the fantasy in me, the fantasy player in me. I'd rather kind of look at the yards and uh, the yards per attempt and everything like that. Only six and a half yards per attempt. It took four sacks and obviously it all worked out. They won 34 to seven. The Vikings were great in this game. I do think they are relying so heavily on Aaron Jones and Justin Jefferson that I, I if one of those guys goes down, I think they're in big trouble. Um, I don't know if anyone's stepping into either of those roles. Aaron Jones, 19 carries, 102 yards. He was fantastic. And Justin Jefferson had all of his, I think he had all of his catches in the first half. Um, and I watching that first half, six for 81 and a touchdown. It felt like he had 11 for 150 and a touchdown in that first half. He was all over the place and at every important kind of part of every early drive for Minnesota was Jefferson getting a first down. It felt like so. Uh, Jeff, I think the the breaking news from this game is that Justin Jefferson and Brian Flores are really good. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry for the spiel there. That was a long one. No, no, you're good. I uh, got a couple comments here about the 49ers. Mr. Crockpot asks what's going on with the Niners. Anthony says their pass rush is bad this year. Um, Daniel says he would love Brian Flores as the head coach of the Eagles. We'll get to the 49ers um, here briefly. Uh, we got a few more games to go. We'll get into that afternoon slate. So, I guess we should talk about that real quick before we move on, though, because that's kind of the talk of everywhere. Brian Flores, what do you give kind of his chances of landing a head coaching job with? He obviously had a pretty good tenure in, in Miami in terms of like won a good amount of games, didn't make the playoffs, but obviously had kind of the beef with Tua, which I think you could really look at both ways. And it's, one of those he said, she said situations. And uh, I, we kind of both side with Tua in, in how that was handled. And I think that there's a lot that maybe Flores could even grow from, from that situation. He also sued the NFL for yeah. wrongful termination and sued the Dolphins. People are all saying like, he's going to get a job. I don't think enough people are paying attention to that fact. I think it's going to be a hard sell. I think Minnesota that. is in the perfect place because they yep. have – a really good defensive coordinator that's virtually unhirable as a head coach. Like I don't think NFL teams are going to be clamoring to hire him because of the lawsuit. And we said that at the time, and now you've got all the Tua stuff that came out too. I think that's another kind of a black mark. So, um, you know, I really like Brian Flores and I do hope he gets another shot one day. I think he deserves another shot. I think that he was kind of scapegoated in the whole Miami thing. Uh, but I kind of suspect it's not coming anytime soon. I have a little bit of a Brian Flores take, and everyone says like, oh, he's going to be an NFL head coach. I think Brian Flores' best path is to go take a big college job and be a head coach. You can kind of be tougher on guys at the college level than you can at the NFL level. Maybe not as much anymore with the transfer portal and NIL. It's not quite what it was. I do think he's probably a bit of a tough love guy with his, with his guys as Tua would tell you. Um, and I think that probably flies a little bit more at the college level. You also get to pick your own guys. So he could totally pick or in terms of who you recruit and what types of players you recruit, you can kind of pick guys that fit specifically for his system specifically for his defense and the, the type of quarterback that he would want, not maybe not Tua. Um, so I think that's actually his best path forward. I, I think he'd be a great college head coach. Maybe Oklahoma yeah. will give him a call. I don't think Oklahoma's going to move on, but we'll see. So, all right, let's keep shot. rolling. That was, that was an unnecessary shot. By, yeah, by yeah, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> we'll talk about that later off the air. No. <laughs> um, let's go to Los Angeles where the Pittsburgh Steelers 
defeat the Los Angeles Chargers 20 to 10. Justin Fields had his best game as a Steeler. Uh, he completes his first 10 passes. He ended 25 at 32 for 245 yards and a touchdown. He did throw an interception and take two sacks. The interception is probably a pass he shouldn't have thrown, but I will note it did hit two Steelers before yep. it was intercepted. So he probably shouldn't have thrown it. It also shouldn't have been an interception. It should have just hit the dirt and it was kind of bad luck there. But um, Justin Herbert entered this game with an ankle injury. Uh, he left the game with an ankle injury and Ty Taylor Heineke came in. Uh, Taylor Heineke took more sacks than he completed passes. He took three sacks. He threw and completed two passes. The Chargers could not run in this game. They only had 3.1 yards per carry. Uh, and this one's good for the brand, so I have to mention it. But uh, Nick Herbig replaced an injured Alex Highsmith in this game, and he had four pressures and two sacks on only eight pass rushes. And Herbig was a guy that I kind of liked coming out of the draft. So yeah. it's nice to see him get a little shot there for the Steelers. Uh, what, what are your takeaways from this one? announce Justin Fields as the official full-time starter today. Do it right now. Give the man his flowers. I just sent Shane two DMs on Twitter of two plays he made in this game, two throws he made. And it's to back up a point. This was one of the – I told Shane I had some hot takes coming in. This was the Justin Fields we thought we were getting from Ohio State, the guy we saw in this game throwing over the middle in ways that we really didn't see him do in Chicago. Chicago was afraid to have him throw over the middle. They only wanted him to throw uh, to the sidelines. It seemed like uh, I, I think that what you saw in this game with the zip on passes across the middle, I just sent Shane two of them, obviously the Calvin Austin touchdown, uh, which a lot of people have seen. There was another throw that went incomplete in this game that I was blown away by the throw from Fields to Fryermuth. I don't know if Shane, or, or were you able to pull that up? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good throw. Would you want to? Would I think we should throw it up here on the? On oh the yeah, screen yeah. People could watch. Yeah. yeah the, hold on. I'll YouTube. throw it up. You keep talking. I'll throw it up on the other screen for the YouTube listeners. Yeah, th this was obviously Justin Fields has done a lot of nice things in, in the first two games. I've come on kind of glowing both both weeks that we've talked about Justin Fields, and I've been really high on just the idea of the Steelers having an identity with him. That's if we'll, we'll, we'll play it back from the start again, but here's Justin Fields throwing to Fryermuth across the middle through a window of like three guys and fits it right in. Fryermuth ends up dropping it because he, he can't complete the ground, uh, can't complete the catch to the ground, but it's a pretty incredible throw from fields. And that's the kind of stuff you saw all the time at Ohio state. And it's why I think Shane and I were dumbfounded at times in Chicago why they were being so conservative with him and why they weren't letting him kind of do the things we saw so much. And then here's obviously the throw across the middle to Calvin Austin, very similar type of throw. And then Calvin Austin goes and makes a nice play with it after the catch, but fields kind of throws him open as well in the crosser there. I loved everything I saw from Pittsburgh in this game from TJ Watt being so dominant from fields, making these types of throws that we just didn't see him make in Chicago. I am so high on this Steelers team to the point where I think they I, – I give me the Steelers as a contender before the Vikings. How about that for a take? All right. I like it. Uh, as I always said, Justin Fields should always be the starter in Pittsburgh, and uh, Russ can just keep wearing his shoulder pads on the sideline, and the Steelers will be in a lot better place for it for sure. They've got to be like your second team right now, right? With with Fields in there over Russ. You you hated Russ. You love Fields. They they've got to be almost like that's how they feel for me right now. And I yeah, wasn't I mean, even as big of a Fields guy as you were. State of Pennsylvania, let's go. Uh, yeah. one, one of my one of my best friends is also a Steelers fan. So I've got a buddy that's a big Steelers fan and a buddy that's a big Panthers fan. So I try to keep an eye on their teams for them. And uh, well, the Panthers, yeah. but Steelers, let's go. The red yeah. rifles at the helm. We'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, let's go on to Tampa where the Denver Broncos win 26 to seven. Uh, Bo Nix had a good game and he did it against a Todd Bowles defense that typically gives opposing quarterbacks fits. Now uh, he was four or four for 70 yards. And then he rushed for a two yard touchdown on the opening drive. He ends the day two, uh, 25 for 36 for 216 yards. He did not take a sack. However, he still hasn't thrown a touchdown through three seasons. Um, 
it was not a good day for the Bucks offense. They went three and out on their opening drive. Baker threw a pick on the next drive. Uh, Cade Otten fumbled the ball later in the game. Baker took seven sacks. Uh, the lone bright spot in this game for the Bucks offense was Bucky Irving, who had 70 yards on nine carries. He also had 14 receiving yards on three receptions. So uh, Bucky Irving looked good, but that was really about it for Tampa this week. Uh, what did you take away from this one? Yeah, I think that this was just like a a classic Tampa was never as good as people thought after two games. And it was always going to kind of come crashing back down. And you look at the first game they played against the commanders, Jaden Daniels, a rookie, uh, a completely new defensive scheme with Dan Quinn. And the Bucks are pretty much the same team they were last year. So I think they won that game off continuity. Then you look at last week's game that they beat the Detroit Lions. They had no business winning that game. It was really dumb turnovers. And if you played that game in a vacuum a hundred times, they would have lost it 80 times. Like Detroit outplayed them. Hutchinson sacked them. Uh, was it five times or something in that game? They, they should have won that game. Tampa was absolutely lucky to win it 20 to 16. And this was kind of the receipt on the other end of that, I think. And they just had some bad luck a couple times throughout the game. But yeah, Bo Nix looked really good in, in this game. I'm not a Bo Nix guy, but I think this kind of goes back to, we don't think Russell Wilson's very good, but if you go look at Russell Wilson's stats from last year, he was a part of seven wins. He he threw for like 3,800 yards at like 25 or something touchdowns, only six or seven picks. Like he was able, Sean Payton, I think, is still a good enough coach to be able to mask some offensive kind of deficiencies, but I still think there's too many deficiencies for this to be a consistent thing. Yeah. All right, well, let's keep rolling on here. I didn't find too much terribly interesting in that game. Let's go to uh, Green Bay at Tennessee. Green Bay wins 30-14. to My big takeaway from this game is that situation matters immensely for quarterbacks. Malik Willis started three games for Tennessee in 2022, and he never threw for 100 yards. He never threw for a touchdown. He never rushed for more than 23 yards. In this game against his former team, he was 13-19 and 19 for 202 yards and a touchdown. He rushed for 73 yards and another touchdown. And more importantly, he led the Packers to their second straight win while Jordan Love is injured. And so that's huge for the Packers, a team that was a, a favorite in the NFC. They lose week one, but more than losing, they lose their quarterback to a scary injury. And Will, uh, not Will Levis, uh, Malik Willis has kept the ship afloat. They're 2-1 and one right now. And on the other side, Will Levis's turnover woes just continue. Uh, this time it was a telegraph pass to DeAndre Hopkins that Jair Alexander intercepted and returned for a touchdown. He also had a fumble in scoring range. Uh, this Packers defense has the same number of interceptions now in seven that they had all of last season. So the Packers defense is playing well. The Packers offense is gutting out wins while Jordan Love recovers. Uh, Stock up for the Packers. Yeah, I, I think it's worth taking a sniff on Packers 10-1 to 1 to win the NFC, even maybe 25-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl if you want to get frisky. And this isn't me overreacting. Me and Shane both kind of thought that coming into the year, Green Bay was one of the contenders in the NFC, and I, I still feel that way, especially even more so now. Seeing what they've been able to do without Jordan Love, I think it supplants Matt LaFleur as truly one of the best coaches in the NFL. And I think Jeff Halfley doing a great job as a defensive coordinator. He left uh, Boston College as the head coach to come be the D.C. for Green Bay. And I, I think it's really paid off here so far for Green Bay. And obviously you said the turnover stat there, and that's a big part of that. But they're also able to really run the ball and kind of control the clock. And they've been able to do that in these last two games with the quarterback. But also Josh Jacobs looks kind of like the Josh Jacobs we saw a couple of years ago. Uh, even Emmanuel Wilson, their backup, ha has really stepped up uh, in a couple of spots here. So um, I am looking at Green Bay as one of the very best teams in football uh, and one of the contenders to get to the Super Bowl and maybe even win it. So they have a brutal schedule, uh, obviously really tough division. You look at the Vikings 3-0, uh, and the, the Lions 2-1, and I still think a contender in the, in the NFC. And you look at the, the Bears are even 1-2. and two. I still think they're a tough out, uh, Chicago, there with that defense. And, and Caleb's going to keep getting better. So uh, I think that that is a, a really tough schedule. So maybe I, I'm, I might only place a little bit on it now. 
but I have my eyes on the Packers uh, as a potential as a potential bet here as a future team to win the NFC, win the Super Bowl. Maybe you wait until after this Vikings game next week. Obviously, really big for the division there. It, it, it's in Green Bay, so big game there coming up in, in the NFC North. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride or die stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. This episode is brought to you by Pillsbury Toaster Strudel. Make every morning a memory with Toaster Strudel, a fun, convenient, and sweet part of breakfast. Made with sweet filling, creamy icing, and flaky crust, and prepared in minutes in the toaster, oven, or an air fryer. They're the perfect answer to your on-the-go breakfast needs. Mornings are better together with Toaster Strudel. Pick up Toaster Strudel on your next shopping trip. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Let's get into the Sunday afternoon slate. We've got five games remaining here. Uh, Carolina Panthers at the Las Vegas Raiders. They win 36 to 22. Uh, Andy Dalton walking down the field for 70 and 75 yard touchdown drives on two of the first three possessions really uh, tells you everything you need to know about Bryce Young at this point. Uh, Daniel or Dalton ended the game 26 to 37 for 319 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. He took two sacks. Uh, Deontay Johnson had eight catches for 122 yards and a touchdown. Chuba Hubbard had 114 rushing yards. Uh, so the offense clicked here for the Panthers. It was the first time a Panthers quarterback has thrown three touchdowns in the first half of a game since Cam Newton did it back in 2015. So on their side, Went really well. On the Raiders' side, not so much. Gardner Minshew really struggled on the day. He was 18 of 28 for 214 yards and a touchdown, and he threw an interception. Following that interception, Aiden O'Connell entered the game for the final drive, and he did lead a touchdown on that drive. So there were some strange comments after the game from uh, the head coach talking about some people making business decisions out there and that we'll make some business decisions too, to which – I tweeted as a lifelong Raiders fan. Uh, I think they should trade Brock Bowers to the Eagles for Grant Calcaterra. Uh, get him off of that team. So uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Mark. But what do you think about this game? I actually think that quote was about Jack Jones, uh, their cornerback. I saw two two tweets out there with him totally just like a guy was like being wrapped up by someone right next to him. And he kind of went and like stood next to them instead of like actually joining the tackle and trying to tackle a running back. So a couple pretty rough tackling attempts, it looked like. And then I also saw some Tyree Wilson, uh, some people saying Tyree Wilson looked like he wasn't running at all uh, to try to uh, try to get running backs towards the end of the game. So uh, I think that I think Antonio Pierce probably focused on the defense. So I think there's been yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people are, have attributed that to Devonte Adams um, and people have attributed that to the quarterback change as well. I think it probably had more to do with the defense personally. I, Fine. I think- Max Crosby for Bryce Huff. I'll even throw in a seventh. Yeah, round pick. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I was just, that was my, my takeaway from it though. I, I, I don't have much on this one. I, I really don't. It, it was pretty shocking to see how bad, how bad the Raiders looked in this game. But um, it, it almost, it was kind of like when a head coach gets fired, it felt like, 
and you, they always say bet the interim coach in their first game. I feel like this was like the interim quarterback game yeah. where, where it felt like you, you probably I should have bet the Panthers. I stayed away from this one. Just an overarching take from the day. After going through these games, this wasn't something I realized while watching, but I'm looking at it now. You look at the teams that lost these games, and there's a very common theme. They couldn't run the ball. Raiders couldn't run the ball in this game. DeAndre Swift and the Bears couldn't run the ball. Browns couldn't run the ball against the Giants. The Titans were horrible on the ground against Green Bay. The Bucks, I guess Bucky Irving ran the ball well. Rashad White didn't. The Texans didn't run the ball well without Mixon. The Chargers were not good on the ground, and that's kind of their whole identity. Even the Saints didn't get nearly the amount on the ground that you thought they would against the Eagles. Kind of a theme on Sunday, it seems like. The teams that ran the ball well won the game. Go figure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get on to Miami. This is a game I don't have a lot to say about either. Seattle wins. It falls 20- under that same theme, by the way. Yeah. Seattle wins 24 to thir- or to three. Uh, Seattle scored 17 points on their first four drives, which was more than enough to take down the Dolphins with Tua on IR. Um, there's some struggles offensively for Seattle. Their offensive line is inconsistent at times. And Gino was a little hit or miss, but the Seahawks stand at three and O with their biggest perceived competition at one and two right now in the 49ers. My real question is how good is the Seattle defense? They're the first three and O team to allow less than 150 passing yards in each of their first three games since 1979. But They got Bo Nix in week one, New England in week two, and now Skylar Thompson slash Tim Boyle in week three. So, I mean, you you bring in a new coach. It's always great to start 3-0. and The defense has looked incredible. I'm ready to see him play some decent offenses and see if this thing is for real, though. And I don't really know. And there's just not a lot interesting for me in this game against Miami without Tua. I think that line, that Seahawks Lions Monday night or next week is going to be really interesting. And, and I think we're going to find out a lot about Seattle. I think Detroit probably puts it on them uh, offensively. I think we get a little bit of humble pie served to, served to Seattle. I said go, after week two, the least impressive 2-0 and of all time, uh, winning by six against Bo Nix and then winning by three in overtime against the Patriots. I think that's still bared out. Um, and, and I think the Seahawks would fall into that overrated tag just by the proxy of being a three and O team. That's really lucky with their schedule. I will say after the Seahawks game, they get the giants at home. They'll beat the giants at home. So they're mm-hmm. going to be, I think they're going to be four and one. Yeah. So at that point, you really just probably have to go like six and six to close the year to potentially win that division, maybe seven and five. So Seattle setting themselves up here to not have to really be that good down the stretch um, just with such a great start here. Um, tough schedule for sure for Seattle. That division's weird. Uh, San Fran one and two. The Rams, maybe we thought we're, we're counting out of them. They kind of come back and they win that game. They're one and two. And, and then Arizona, obviously they, they lost the game we'll talk about, but they're one and two. They look competent. They definitely look like a pretty a, a team that can be live in terms of a playoff contender. So uh, really interesting division there. Obviously Seattle running away with it. I wouldn't bank on them finishing it out though. Yeah, I just realized as you were saying that the whole NFC West played in the afternoon because next yeah. up we've got Detroit at Arizona and Detroit wins the game 20 to 13. They scored three touchdowns on their first four drives, but they laid a goose egg in the second half. Uh, Goff threw a pick. They had a turnover on downs, but their defense stepped up and holds the Cardinals to only three second half points and they escape with a win. Following your theme, the Cardinals couldn't run the ball. They had 2.5 yards per carry, excluding Kyler Murray runs. Uh, The deep passing game that worked so well last week when Kyler was 5 of 5 with three touchdowns on deep passes did not work this week. He was 1 of 7 with an interception. Um, For the Lions, David Montgomery had 23 carries for 105 yards and a touchdown. Jameer Gibbs had 16 carries for 83 yards. Here's my favorite stat. Jameer Gibbs had a 20 yard receiving touchdown on zero targets and zero receptions. That's how that's officially scored. The hook and ladder. They they throw it to Mon Ross St. Brown. He lateraled it to Jameer Gibbs. And I guess technically, yeah, that's not a catch. It's not a target, but it is a 20 yard receiving touchdown. So uh, there you go. 20 yard receiving touchdown with no receptions is, is kind of a funny stat on a box score. I, I think this is like, if you ask Dan Campbell, like, what's your ideal game look like? 
it feels like it's this one. It feels like <laughs> it, it's Montgomery and Gibbs run for 39, 39 carries for 188 yards and a touchdown. Um, you, you hold the other team to 13 points. Your, your O-line looks pretty good. Like maybe you would have gotten Sam Laporta a little bit more involved in his like ideal game script, but uh, Amon Rock gets involved and they run the fun hook and ladder type play that gets everyone talking about how genius they are. Like, I, I feel like this is like exactly how Dan Campbell wants the game to go. And I actually walked out of this game really. I think a lot of people are like, oh, Detroit, a little clunky. They went into Arizona and won by seven. I don't think Arizona is a bad team. And, mm-hmm. and I think going into Arizona is always hard. It's it's a tough place to play in terms of like the dome and air, the, the I, I just always feel like Arizona is a tough place to play as a home dog, especially I love betting the Cardinals. Bet the Cardinals in this one and lost. My biggest takeaway, maybe from the entire day, was that this Lions defense is for real. I, I'm yeah. buying in on it. I, I like this defense. You look at last week against Tampa, obviously gave up 20 points, but they had uh, Hutchinson had five sacks. And it, I, I think that they should have won that game. Bucks couldn't run the ball in that game. Cardinals couldn't run the ball today. Rams didn't really run the ball that well in week one. I think this is a great run defense. And, and I think that the, the pass rush has gotten better. The secondary has gotten better. And I know that there's a lot of people saying, oh, Detroit looking clunky, golf not looking as good. I think th- I'm not as concerned about that as I am uh, encouraged about the defense. Uh, I, I think that defense is a real contending defense. Yeah, which is a huge change from last year where that defense was kind of the the Achilles heel. So um, I, I had a Lions fan tweeting at me like, because I tweeted about how, how impressed I was with the defense. And I had a Lions fan tweeting at me like, hey, uh, is there – am I right to think that I should feel better about this than if they were doing the exact same thing last year? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I have a lot of confidence in uh, Ben Johnson and in that offensive line. And so we see every year that offenses can struggle a little bit early yeah. on. And I'm, I'm fine with that. If I'm a lions fan, I'd feel a lot better about where you're at right now than where you were at down the stretch last year. Yeah. You feel like the offense will get back to where it is. You have Gibbs, Montgomery, Amon, Ra, Laporta, golf, obviously a really good O line. Like I, I think the offense will get back to at least close to what it was last year. If the defense can level up, I think that's a way bigger kind of development. Yeah. We've got a comment coming in here from sloth on Twitter. that says the Cardinals are 11 and 24 at home since 2020. But well, that's a little skewed. Kyler Murray missed like a, a good chunk of games there, and I, I think they were. Yeah, I, I think that's a little skewed. But yeah, I mean, there's there's two four and thir- two four and thirteen seasons in there. I think that I just think the Cardinals are a much better team this year, um, and a lot of that has to do again with Murray being healthy. So they, the Cardinals have had good years with Kyler. I, I think the years that they've been good, they've been better at home. Like when they went eleven and six. Uh, let's take a look here in 2021. The the Arizona Cardinals. This is a this is bad radio, so I apologize. But at home in 2021, talk talk for me real quick, Shane. I'm sorry. Okay, well I don't really have much else to say about that game, so um, move on to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all you find it, and we'll come back to it here in a minute. But the next game in the division, we've got. Uh, the car or the Rams, excuse me, at the 49ers, the Rams win 27 to 24. Uh, the Rams found themselves in a quick hole in this game down 14 zero. Uh, they looked on their way to their first zero and three start in the Sean McVay era. Then they went on a 16 play 87 yard touchdown drive that took almost eight minutes off the clock uh, to close the gap to seven at halftime. And that's not easy to do. Like, it's easy to get punched in the mouth and find yourself down 14 zero and sort of panic. So able to sustain that long drive and go score in the second half, they punted on their opening drive, but then they went touchdown field goal, touchdown field goal uh, to win the game for the 49ers. Uh, we had some guys asking earlier in the chat, uh, Mr. Crockpot was talking about what's going on with the Niners. I mean, in this game, they're missing Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel and George Kittle. Uh, somebody had to step up and it wasn't Brandon Ayuk, which to be fair, the Rams were determined not to let Brandon Ayuk beat them. They were, he was drawing double coverage a lot, 
but it was Jawan Jennings who had 11 catches for 175 yards and three touchdowns on 12 total targets. He had never had a 100 yard game before. It was the first double digit catch three plus touchdown day for a 49ers wide receiver since Jerry Rice. So the Jawan Jennings game, you know, it's got to suck as a guy that's like been in the league a while and you just have this like game that's twice as good as any game you've ever played. And ultimately it's in a losing effort. Cause it's like, man, I can't even like show up to the facility tomorrow, all smiles because we lost. So that kind of stinks, but really good game by Juwan Jennings. Do you want me to be honest, Shane? I did not see a snap of this game. I, I was locked in on the other games that were going on. And I had a buddy text me and be like, Cowboys and the 49ers lose. And I was like, whoa, like, the 49ers <laughs> lost that game? Like, and then I had to like go back and research and see what happened. I was shocked. And you look at the box score, like Purdy, 22 for 30 for 292 yards and three touchdowns. Like you would have thought maybe no Debo, no Christian McCaffrey, no Kittle. Like maybe Purdy looks normal and that's how they lose. But that wasn't even the case. Like it, pretty crazy that San Fran lost this game from – a guy who didn't watch it. Joe Chick comments, go ahead, Shane, blame Kyle Shanahan for the San Fran loss here. Uh, Joe Chick is a Kyle Shanahan, a Kyle Shanahan stan, I, I should say. Ooh, uh, I like that. He, he's a Falcons. He's a Falcons fan. He, he uh, probably attributes Matt Ryan and their like most successful season, even though they lost 28 to three. Sorry, Joe. Um, as like, that's the Shanahan that, you know, he loves Shanahan because of that season and giving, getting Ryan the MVP, getting them to the Super Bowl. Um, so he, he, he always takes issue when Shane trashes Shanahan. You have a response, uh, Shanahan. I mean, I will say I didn't like kicking a field goal on fourth and two at the Rams eight yard line. I wasn't, I, that's not the call that I would make. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, if I remember correctly, that was to push it from a four point game to a seven point game. So I do get it. At least it's not the call I would prefer to make. Um, but no, I mean, when you're down that many play, and granted the Rams are down a lot of guys offensively too. Uh, but when you're down that many guys, if you can go squeak out a win, it's good, but you certainly don't expect it. And I think it is a testament to the depth they have that George, or maybe it's just the system. I don't know. Maybe it's just the system. Maybe it's not the depth, but that Jawan Jennings can step up that, uh, Oh crap. What's the running backs first Jordan name? Mason, Jordan. Yeah. Mason. I knew Mason. I was thinking, yeah, Jordan Mason has been able to do what he's been able to do. So I ultimately, I ultimately think the 49ers will end up being fine if they can get healthy and stay healthy and, you know, down the stretch, when you get to January football, Christian McCaffrey missing a month early in the season might be really good uh, if he's fully healthy then and his legs are a little fresher. But they don't look like the same juggernaut, and maybe it will all collapse. Um, if they were losing these games fully healthy, then I would say it's time to cash out on those, you know, ca cash in on the, the whole the 49ers might fall off this year. But with injuries, it's so unpredictable. So I guess we'll just wait and see. We've got some comments ringing in here. Uh, Abby said it is Shanahan's fault for playing Ronnie Bell over Cowling. I did see a lot of people talking about how bad Ronnie Bell was in, in this game. Joe Chick commenting, Ayuk's the bigger issue for them. He's averaging like four catches uh, per 45 yards per game so far this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the late start to the year is, is probably going to affect the guy. Like you look at Jamar, who looked terrible in week one, looked a little better in week two. But I'd expect guys like Jamar and Ayuk and those guys who kind of held out or whatever the case may be uh, uh, to probably, you know, beat themselves by, by uh, week four, week five of the year. And in fairness to Brandon Ayuk, like the Rams were absolutely devoting a lot of extra attention to him in that game. Like yeah. there's one, one of the Jawan Jennings touchdowns. You can see like there is a middle field high safety and Brandon Ayuk is isolated and at the snap, he immediately breaks to go bracket Brandon Ayuk and Juwan Jennings just like wide open up the seam. Like, yeah, if you were playing sound coverage, you should be slanting towards that three receiver side. And they, so they were very determined not to let Brandon Ayuk do something. So, I mean, yeah, we've got another comment about Ayuk having some drops. And I think there's, I think there's both things are true. He's been yeah. sloppy. Uh, he has certainly not been helped by all these other guys being out too. So it's a bad look, no doubt, when you hold out and now all of a sudden your team's one and two and you're not doing a lot. Um, but, but we believe in Brandon Ayuk here. This is a Brandon Ayuk podcast here.
this is a Brandon Ayuk podcast. So I think I think he'll bounce back and be fine. I honestly think the 49ers will probably be fine if they can get healthy and just stay afloat until that happens. I agree. I agree. So, all right, let's get on to the last game and let's talk about the Kansas City Chiefs beating the Atlanta Falcons 22 to 17. This Chiefs offense is still struggling to find its footing. And by the way, we talk a little more about the 49ers. If you're a fan of the show, hop in in the live chat and mention something and maybe we'll riff on it a little bit more because I certainly didn't have that many notes on the 49ers, but always fun interacting with you guys. So keep those comments coming. Uh, the Chiefs offense struggling to find its footing though. Uh, Travis Kelsey is not making an impact. He had 30 yards in this one. Uh, through three games, he has 69 yards and no touchdowns. Uh, Rasheed Rice did have a really good game through the air. He had 12 receptions for 110 yards and a touchdown. But the real story was the Chiefs defense. They held Bajan Robinson to 31 yards on 16 carries. Tyler Algier had 32 yards on seven carries. Uh, so he fared a little bit better. But the Chiefs pass rush came alive too. They, they had really struggled to generate pressure through the first two weeks of the season. And the Falcons had not allowed pressure through the first two weeks of the season, but they pressured Cousins on 42% of his dropbacks in this game. Uh, the Falcons scored touchdowns on two of their first three drives, but they only scored three points the rest of the game. They had a first, uh, first down on the 11-yard line with 532 left, down five, and they turned it over on downs. They got a three and out. And then they drove to the Kansas City 22 with a minute 44 left. And then they ultimately turned it over on downs after they were stuffed on both a third and one and a fourth and one. Uh, so the Falcons were there. Like there were opportunities for them to go knock the Chiefs off here. Uh, it ultimately just didn't come to fruition. What did you make of this one? Yeah, I, I thought that the the Chiefs were lucky to get a stop at the end of the game. I mean, if Bijan, they they said Bijan, uh, the play was audibled into by Kirk at, at the line uh, to a Bijan run instead of a pass. I think that was they should have passed the ball. It seemed like they were getting down the field that way, and they switched to the they switched to the run, and the Chiefs stuffed them. My biggest takeaway from the game, though, is the Atlanta Falcons. I was big on them as a potential team that could win the NFC, and I have bets on them. Uh, to do so that I, I think after a couple of weeks I was looking at to burn, especially after week one. But th after three weeks, they lost a really close game to Pittsburgh, who's now 3-0. and They beat the Eagles um, uh, in Philly, whether or not we think that they deserve to or not, or if they were a huge part of it, or if we lost the game, that's a different conversation. But, oh, uh, no. Nope, it looks like we lost Mark for a second. So we'll see if Mark pops back in here. I briefly heard an oh no as he started to freeze, which is always funny when that happens in live podcasting. But I'll pick up there. We've got a comment coming, ask, coming in asking if the Falcons are better than the Saints. I mean, that's so hard to tell through three weeks of the season. Uh, here Mark is back on his phone. Uh, Mark, uh, finish your train of thought and tell me if you think the Falcons are better than the Saints too. Yeah, I would I would say so. I, I like them minus one and a half this week against the Saints uh, at home. I think that line should be more like minus three, minus three and a half. I think they're a slightly better team. You look at the that the Falcons being one and two with two really close losses. Maybe they probably should have won the Kansas City game, and maybe they should have lost the Philly game, but that evens out. Maybe I should have not placed any of those Falcons wagers until after week three because we knew – coming into the year that Steelers Eagles Chiefs was a pretty tough way to start the season. And you look at the rest of the way, a lot of NFC South teams to play, obviously six of them. Um, you have some other easy games sprinkled in there. I feel really good about the Falcons making the playoffs again. I don't know if they're a contender the way I thought they were. Kirk has looked kind of the way I expected him to uh, after week one, looking really concerning. Um, but I, I think the biggest takeaway from this game is Atlanta is actually going to be just fine. Yeah. I've got a trivia question for you, Mark. Uh, what player has intercepted Patrick Mahomes the most in his career? Jesse Bates. Justin Simmons. Oh, oh, you're right. I don't know why yeah. I went to Jesse Bates. Yeah. Yeah. So Justin Simmons recorded his sixth career interception against Patrick Mahomes in this game. It's also the fourth straight time they faced off that he's intercepted Mahomes. Uh, no other player has intercepted Mahomes more than twice in his career. So I thought that was kind of a cool Justin Simmons stat. Obviously, they played in the same division for a lot of years yeah. until this year, so he had more opportunities. But 
Uh, Joe Ciccoletti says the Falcons coming out and playing the way they did versus the Chiefs on a short week and an emotional win in Philadelphia. Uh, he'll take it. Uh, yeah, we had a comment for Simmons coming in from the chat on the trivia question. So uh, anyways, there you go. That is our look at the week three NFL slate. Uh, Mark, obviously two Monday night games tonight that we're not talking about. They haven't happened yet, but uh, Eagles fans can keep a close eye on that Commanders Bengals game tonight. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the people? Uh, did Becky ever bark for a, a Super Bowl favorite during this podcast? Anything you need to leave with the people? Nah, she thinks all these teams stink. This whole NFL stinks. Everybody stinks. Uh, no, but I'll just say I, the only bets I like tonight are Josh Allen anytime touchdown and Jaden Daniels anytime touchdown. Um, I'm not on any side in the game. It does feel like Jacksonville's got to come out and play desperate, though, right? It, it, I think they've got to stay in this game, at least. You've got to see something from Trevor in that offense that makes you feel good going forward. I'd really like to see Jacksonville step up in that game, whether it's a win or even just looking good offensively. And then Washington, you just want to see, I, I like, Jaden Daniels, how, how he keeps developing. Um, I actually think he that's the more interesting side of that game. I think since he probably gets right and wins the game, um, but I'm just interested to watch Jaden Daniels. So Josh Allen touchdown, probably my favorite of the two. Uh, I think it's around minus 110. They can get Jaden Daniels plus 150, uh, but I, I feel really good about Josh scoring this week after he didn't last week. It's almost like Jalen Hurts touchdown. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Thank you for joining us for episode number 171 of Chalk Talk. If you enjoy what you heard on the show, and we know that you do, Smash that subscribe button on the Eagles Pin Pool Network so you don't miss any of our episodes. We've got six long-form shows a week as well as daily updates about the Eagles. Drop us a five-star rating wherever you stream your podcasts. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I am at Shane Half NFL. He is at Mark Henry Jr. And we will catch you guys next time. <laughs>